Hello everyone and welcome to Love Talk. Time to communicate with Helena and James. For those of you who have just tuned in, our show explores love and its many faces. Communication is the heart of any successful relationship. In fact, it is the key to my 14-year marriage with James. Our show aims to share with you both the hard and the good times of our long-lasting relationship. So if you believe love is in the air, let's explore it together. Today's topic is the science of love, understanding what love is from a scientific perspective, confronting our experience of love with the latest scientific research. Will love still be a mystery after this episode? Let's see. I'm Abby Marsh, I'm a professor of psychology at Georgetown University. I describe it as an emotion that is a particular response to one person. You love being around that person, you take a lot of pleasure from being in their company, and you're very distressed when you are separated from them. Some of the reasons that love feels good is because of a lot of feel-good hormones that are involved. Dopamine is the sort of reward-seeking, this energized, excited uh, neurotransmitter, uh, and the striatum that is definitely involved in feeling in love. The hormone that is most specific to feeling in love, that is most specific to the social response, is oxytocin, and then um, a closely related um, neuropeptide called vasopressin. Nature really wants love to feel good, right? Nature's imperative is that we reproduce, and love is one of the mechanisms nature has put in place to make sure that we do that. The species that tend to parabon are the ones whose babies require a lot of work. We know that offspring who have two parents who are taking care of them tend to do better on average than offspring who don't. Um, and it's again because they are so much work, especially if there's more than one of them. And so we think that nature set us up to form long-term pair bonds to ensure that our uh, offspring would have the best chance of survival in the long term. People who excite romantic feelings in us probably also trigger um, increases in oxytocin, which results in this increase in dopamine, and then we find that person, someone we want to stick with. Uh, there is absolutely a lot of research uh, comparing romantic love to uh, addiction um, and the way that people can be addicted to a specific drug. Romantic love is almost like being addicted to a specific person and there are lots of similar neurotransmitters involved, uh, dopamine and opioids being um, the most prominent, but there are other ones as well. And there are things about being in love that are actually sort of like being addicted to something, right? You are um, sort of obsessed with thinking about that thing all the time. When you're away from it, you want more. Um, your capacity for risk taking, uh, to, to get that thing that you crave so much is increased. And the main hormone that comes into play is something called corticotropin releasing factor or CRF. And this is a compound that seems to spike in the brain uh, either when you're separated from the object of your love or if you're separated again from your drug of choice. Um, and this is a hormone that definitely regulates the stress system and it seems to be involved in the feelings of acute stress that you feel right after separation from a loved one and then in the depression that seems to sink in long term. We're nowhere near knowing enough about love to take the mystery out of it. I think that, that if really what people are worried about is that knowing about neurotransmitters like oxytocin is going to take the mystery out of love. That day is a long, long way in the future. I don't think they have anything to worry about. So there's a few interesting things for us to talk about there. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that uh, when a person is in love, and we'll talk about this thing of being in love in just a moment, you know, everything seems more beautiful. Everything seems more colorful and amazing. And you smile more. And it's like the birds sing louder, <laughs> right? But that happens in that first, uh, that first few moments of, of being in love, right? And it doesn't mean that after like us 14 years, we're not in love. We're actually, actually more in love. The difference is that now your world is not just a little bit more pink. Is it has other colors as well? Yeah, right? many, many other colors. And and I was I would even say if people were more in love 
you know, the world would be such a nicer place to be in. And uh, I, I agree with you, you know, in the beginning you have those butterflies and everything, but then you get so much more colorful things afterwards, mm -hmm. but still the world would the be The butterflies so much nicer. sometimes fly away, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the love carries on. Absolutely. Now, another very important point, and, and this is um, something amazing. So we know, we saw that through the video, this has been scientifically proven that after a couple has sex, the, the brain develops this oxytocin, which is what brings a couple together. It's what develops attachment between a couple. And this is so important, why? Because if you are in a, two, two points, if you're in a marriage, in a committed relationship, the more you are intimate together, the more attached you will be. So people who say, you know, I've been together with my partner for 20 years. Actually, someone one, once told me, you know, I had, a, I had a child. After I had my child, I told my husband, never again. We never sleep together again. That's it. <laughs> the, the purpose of us sleeping together was having a child. That's a bad idea, right? Mm -mm. Not good, not good. I would even say that, you know, couples who are very busy uh, with work, because it's true, let's face it, we need to work hard for us to be able to provide for the kids, the mortgage and everything else but you should always make time for, for your intimacy because that's what's gonna it's the glue yeah. that will get you together for a long long time until absolutely you know, death does you part that's that's the first point right if, yeah. if you are in a committed relationship then the the, the the sexual relationship needs to happen often so you yeah. can develop that attachment yeah. the yeah. second point about this is that if you go around indiscriminately sleeping with this one today, with that one tomorrow, your brain will develop the opposite of attachment, will develop a detachment. Because if you associate being together with someone in bed with not being with that person again next week because you go from one to the other, your brain gets used to this and you will associate the act of being intimate with someone mm. with not a committed relationship. And that's why a lot of people have problems with sex because they think, oh, sex for me brings me bad memories because of, you know, not associating that with a committed relationship. Absolutely. And, and, and it tends to bring a lot of hurt. And that's, I believe, it's one of the reasons why people just, you know, they, they, they switch on that mode into the mode, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, deep down, speaking from a woman's perspective, you, you do miss the attachment, you do miss you know, the after, the intimacy uh, moment. But because you don't get it, you do get this yeah. kind of um, feeling afterwards. Absolutely. Let's see the second video on the science of love. Chocolate and roses might be traditional Valentine's Day gifts, but if it's true, lasting love that you're after, consider a chemistry set instead. It may not sound very romantic, but scientists have discovered that many of the good feelings we associate with falling in love and living happily ever after are linked to chemical reaction in the brain. The hormones estrogen and testosterone drive initial feelings of lust. But then as relationships develop, so do more complex feelings and chemical reaction. If you've ever gotten nervous and felt your heart race before a date, that's probably adrenaline. Dopamine is responsible for the euphoric feeling of being love-struck. And when serotonin kicks in, it can keep your love constantly popping into your head. Those initial feelings of infatuation may fade, but the brain is still cooking up a different kind of chemical cement. The hormones oxytocin and vasopressin are released after sex and are linked to long-term feelings of attachment. So why does the brain work that way to promote pairing? While a few other animals like prairie voles, black vultures, and mute swans form lifelong pairs, 95% of animal species don't. Some evolutionary biologists theorize that because human babies rely on their parents for such a long time compared to other animals, feelings of love were evolutionary adaptations to make it more likely that parents would stick together and more likely to get roses or chocolate or a chemistry set on Valentine's Day. We're going to have to talk about that video just after the break because we're running out of time. But if you have a question, if you have a doubt, if you want to talk about any relationship related issue, you can get in contact with us, we're always there to help. If you want to do that, here's how you can do it. Well, uh, the email address is lovelab at lovetalkshow.tv and we also have our Instagram account, we also have our Facebook account and of course our website, lovetalkshow.tv. You are more than welcome to join us, okay? 
Don't go anywhere. After the break, we're going to be talking about that extra video that you just saw right there. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's just get one thing out of the way right now, mm. right? The video said, you know, chocolates and roses and perfumes, all that kind of stuff. When was the last time I gave you some chocolate? I can't remember. I, mm. I remember the last time I gave chocolates to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm telling, I'm going to tell you why I said this, because a lot of people put so much emphasis on this. We hear a lot of couples say, oh, I can't remember. Uh, the last time my husband gave me roses. Trust me, she can't remember either. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't happen not a very big often. Deal. However, romance is not really about this necessarily. It's a good thing you may remember the person and bring some flowers and chocolates. But it's a lot more than that. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the little things that you say, the little things you do that make a, a big difference. Absolutely. And, and to me, romance is faithfulness, you know, calling me to check on me if I'm okay and looking after me if I'm not well and all this kind of thing. I think this for me, it's a lot worth many chocolates and, and I believe that you also at home uh, agree with me. And of course, the, the ever so uh, famous chocolate milk at one o'clock in the morning, right? Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, another thing we have to talk about, which is important on that video, is that love is a chemical reaction, exchange kind of thing, right? It is true that when you, you, you choose someone and you are with someone and you build a life with that person, you know, there is something that connects you to that person. Your brain automatically makes you look at that person differently than you look at anybody else. You would do everything to protect that person. And you wouldn't necessarily do that for someone else because your brain has connected. You, you, have, you, you see this person as an integral part of your life. And that doesn't happen because of your feelings. That has happened because your brain has made a decision that this person is important to you. You have connected. Now imagine, you, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm thinking, imagine if you play tricks on your chemicals, okay? I'm just thinking here. Because chemicals makes, you know, in your brain makes you be attached and all this kind of thing. It's all a reaction. But what happens when you're not faithful, for example? When you are in a relationship, in a serious relationship, and then you decide to try other things, okay? What, what do you think may happen to the brain? I think it's like the person ends up a bit confused and a bit... Uh, you know, like, oh, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have mixed feelings. And then we hear the very famous say, oh, I, I, I've fallen out of love and I don't know, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you believe that the chemicals are confused? <laughs> yeah, you, I, I mean... Chokes aside. Of you course, you, you, you don't really fall out of love. Of course, if you start doing a lot of silly things, your, your brain, just like your brain got attached, your brain gets detached because of the mistakes you made, of course. Now, here's a next video because today's all about the science of love. For me, this was the last big question. Um, why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? I've always known there was chemistry in the brain to romantic love, but maybe there's chemistry between certain kinds of people. So I began to look into the genetic literature to find out who we are and then who we love. As it turns out, there's a lot of chemicals in the brain that code for the blinking of the eye, the pounding of the heart, etc. But there's only a few chemicals that seem to be directly related to um, personality traits. Dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen and oxytocin. And these four chemical types I call the explorer, the builder, the director, and the negotiator. The explorer tends to be risk-taking, novelty-seeking, curious, creative, spontaneous, optimistic. Barack Obama is a perfect example. So is Angelina Jolie, very different kinds of people, but both have that energy, curiosity. The second type is the builder. These people are calm, social, popular, cautious, but not fearful. They're traditional, often religious. I think George Washington was a good example. Tiger Woods is a good example. The third type is the director. They're direct, decisive, tough-minded, competitive, ambitious. Hillary Clinton is a perfect example. John McCain is a very good example. He used the word fight 43 times in his acceptance speech. 
The fourth type is what I call the negotiator. They see the big picture, they're very flexible, imaginative, they're very intuitive, compassionate. Bill Clinton is a perfect example. Men are expressive of estrogen as well as women. What I did on chemistry.com is I studied 40,000 people to see more about these four basic types, and then I watched who was chose to go out with whom for a first date. As it turns out, the explorer type, the dopamine type, tends to be drawn to people like themselves. They want somebody who's energetic, enthusiastic, adventurous, curious, creative. Two explorers who are drawn to each other, I think, are Barack and Michelle Obama. The builder type, they also go for people like themselves, others who are traditional, other builders. The director, the high testosterone type, goes for high estrogen, and the high estrogen goes for high testosterone. And I think a very good example of that is Hillary and Bill Clinton. Hillary is the more high testosterone. She's direct, she's decisive, she's tough-minded, and he's very drawn to her, so that's a very good example. I think that this explains a puzzle that scientists and laymen have wondered forever. Do opposites attract? Do birds of a feather flock together? And as it turns out, it depends on what your personality type is. I think that once you know what type you are, you can help yourself out on the dating scene. For example, explorers are so charismatic and uh, so interesting and so charming. And so I say to them, go slower, don't leap into things. The builder tends to follow rules and schedules. You gotta take some risks. They can be too modest and they should brag a little bit more. The director has to get out there and do the dating. They often find dating a pain in the neck. They want to stay at the desk. They'll bring the Blackberry on the date and keep working. That's a mistake. The negotiator is so flexible, so kind, so compassionate that people will interpret them as a doormat. They won't be decisive. And so they've got to stick up for themselves. They've got to stick up for their ideas. Once you figure out who you are and who you're dating by knowing these personality types, you can reach them. You can find intimacy with them. You can win them. Well, it's important to say that this is a theory, <laughs> right? And theories, sometimes they can be right, uh -huh. sometimes they can be wrong, sometimes they can be half right, they can be half wrong. Let's talk about the opposites attract kind of thing, because Elena and I, we couldn't be more different if we tried. Right? We are very, very different. Do you agree with that? Uh -huh. Very different. I mean, you know, I, I like radical risk-taking kind of things. Elena does not like that. I mean, listen, I'm peaceful. Even, even the, the roller coasters for children, even that is too radical for her. Yeah, the teacup one, you know, the that you go around like this, no thanks. Too much adrenaline, <laughs> right? If, I, if I'm driving and I'm two miles an hour faster than the speed limit, that's it. Elena's throwing up. Uh, a hissy fit, right? Indeed. But the truth is, I mean, in our case, it's true that opposites attract you. It's important to look for similar things, goals and plans and, and you know, things you want to achieve in life together. What you don't have to worry about is stuff like, you know, does she like the same things that I like? Does, is he, is he or she similar to me? That's irrelevant because actually, you know, the person being exactly the same thing as you would be the most boring thing in the world, right? Unless, of course, you think that you are so wonderful that mm -hmm. there, there isn't enough people like you, so you just... <laughs> but we're not talking about this you today. You want to marry a copy, a photocopy. <laughs> you want to you. marry yourself. But that's not the case here today, right? But, James, which one do you think you are from the four? Don't I have avoid. no idea. <laughs> I've, I know that you you seem to be like the builder. I'm the again, second and the last. Again, this is a theory, right? But you seem to be like the builder. <laughs> I think You're you the are the first one. The first one? Yes. Which one was that? A very strong personality, very fun, very outgoing, and you know, very um, risk taker. Yeah. I think that's right. why I but like you. But in this case, the opposites <laughs> attract. And just going back to what we were saying earlier, you know, we, we see a lot of people making like checklists for people they want to date or people they want to marry. And, it, and they make a list of like 20 pages and they include things like, you know, the hair, how the hair has to be, how the, the physique of the person has to be. I heard someone say, you know, the person cannot have a belly, oh, a dear. big belly. 
And, and the, the bad news is that once you marry him, 80% of the times he will eventually get a belly. So unless you're planning to learn how to live with that, you're gonna have to get a divorce pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that, right? <laughs> so the things that are important to tick, like we said, are common goals, yeah. you know, things that are important in life that you need to make sure that you want the same things out of life together. Yes, and, and you know, for example, I, from what you're saying, and, and I've spoken to many people who read a lot about relationships. They, they even come to our seminars and they write notes, many notes, which is not a bad thing, but they read a lot about relationships. I'm sure that when they saw these four types of people, they are like, wow, this is the answer to my questions. And the thing is, the more you read about it, the more you try to understand, I think the less you will know. Because sometimes you just have to meet the person and find out for yeah. yourself, oh, this person is very interesting, and then get to know the person. It, you know, not expecting, oh, she has to be like this, like this, and like that. Yeah. If she is not, mm -mm. Information is important, but there is such a thing as information overload. Exactly. So be careful. Now we have to go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll be seeing another video, watching another video on the science of love. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. We're having a debate here during the break. What am, what am I? I mean, we've, we've come to the conclusion more or less that, El, that Elena is an explorer. Now, not a, no, a builder. No, I'm a builder, a builder and a negotiator. So we're talking, am I a director? <laughs> am I a dictator? <laughs> Maybe that's a new one. They, they need to add a dictator. No, you're there. not a dictator. Am I a director? Am I an explorer? A builder? What's the, the last one? Negotiator. Negotiator. I, I think maybe i'm a little you are, I mean, explorer, you, have to tell you are the explorer a bit of explorer and negotiator i think and a bit okay. of something else this man is very complex <laughs> in a very nice difficult way, to understand <laughs> let's go to another video love has always been considered a matter of the heart but romance is really in our head studies from the last two decades reveal how the brain behaves during each phase of love when two people meet for the first time, their brains size each other up almost instantly. In a game of hot or not, people make up their minds in only 200 milliseconds, and they are especially quick when their response is a definitive not. Your very first impression has a lot to do with appearance. People from many different cultures like symmetrical faces, probably because symmetry reflects good health and desirable genes. We are also attracted to people who share our physical traits, sometimes disturbingly so. One study photoshopped people's faces into members of the opposite gender. Not only did most people fail to recognize the altered photo of themselves, they also gave that photo their highest rating. Voice is important too. <laughs> Women usually like voices that belong to men with attractive bodies masculine faces, broad shoulders, and narrow waists. Men tend to favor voices attached to women with narrow waists, broad hips, and youthful features. The way someone smells changes how we feel about them as well. In a Swiss study, female college students sniffed t-shirts that male college students had slept in for two nights. Most women preferred the scent of t-shirts worn by men whose immune systems were different from their own. The idea is that their children would have more ways to fight off diseases. When you like what you see, hear, and smell, certain chemicals begin to bubble in your brain. Spurts of dopamine and norepinephrine, chemicals that brain cells use to communicate, spark feelings of happiness and excitement. Your heart rate increases, your skin flushes, and you sweat a little. As you get to know someone, a different team of neurotransmitters and hormones starts swimming in your brain. Kissing keeps the dopamine flowing, which keeps pleasure circuits in the brain happy, but it also decreases the amount of cortisol, a stress hormone, and boosts levels of oxytocin, the love hormone. Pretty much any kind of affection kissing, hugging, cuddling, 
elevates oxytocin levels. Scientists have also found that people who are in love have unusually low levels of a vital neurotransmitter called serotonin. Similarly, the brain cells of people with obsessive compulsive disorder are unusually insensitive to serotonin. In other words, love is an obsession. When someone is dumped, that obsession often intensifies. Involuntary memories of lost love overwhelm the rejected party's brain. The breakup becomes a puzzle that must be solved. Some scientists call this state frustration attraction. Romantic rejection keeps serotonin levels low, which fuels the obsession, and stimulates production of dopamine, intensifying the passion. Romantic rejection is also stressful, booing levels of the stress hormone norepinephrine, and it's painful. In fact, as far as your brain is concerned, physical pain and the pain of social rejection are the same thing, activating the same areas of the brain. Love hurts as much as any physical wound. Eventually, the dumped person's brain accepts that it won't get the love it craves like a drug. Levels of dopamine and serotonin normalize. The next time you feel the flutters of first love or the sting of rejection, remember that much of the way you feel is explained by transient chemical changes in the brain. And those same changes are happening in billions of brains around the world, right now, just as they have for millions of years. That person who was uh, voicing <laughs> the, the video needs to find love. His voice is very monotone, right? Well, some adrenaline. He needs some voice. adrenaline, some excitement. <laughs> right, there's something I wanted to talk about, Elena, because mm. he said there that we, we make our mind up whether we are attracted to someone or not in, in milliseconds. I mean, in blink of an eye almost. Wow. And, and that's a big mistake because how many times have you fallen in love with someone that you initially didn't necessarily have an attraction for. Mm -hmm. And you cannot make up your mind about someone just because of the way they look in the beginning, actually. This is a, a problem we usually address in our love therapy sessions every Saturday at 7 p.m. at the Rainbow Theater. The, the problem with many people, you know, discarding potential suitors just at face value because they didn't even give the person a chance to, to show who they are. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you have this person who may not necessarily look like Brad Pitt, and that's assuming that Brad Pitt is handsome. Yeah, he's not even handsome. But that's what people say. But this person has so much personality, so much character, mm -hmm. so much to offer, and then later they say, wow, I, you know, this person, I didn't think they were like that, and they fall in love. And it's so unfair. I know it's chemicals and all these kind of things that we just heard, but you know, it's up to us to, educate ourselves and think, hold on, maybe the person Absolutely. is having a bad day. Yeah. For example, I was even watching a TV on Saturday night, which I love, we, we both like to watch. Uh, and, um, you know, it's like when they go on a date, the girl is so nervous that she, she acts in a very ditzy way and she, she might not even be ditzy. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's a very intelligent, focused young woman, but because she's under, you know, stress, because, you know, it's not easy to go on a first date. You kind of say silly things or you start giggling for nothing. So it's not fair for the person mm -hmm. to think, oh, what a ditzy person. Yeah. I don't want to talk to this person again. So it is unfair. And, and remember, you know, there are two stages we were talking about there, the, the, the lust. And let's not call it lust. Lust is a very negative word. Let's call it physical attraction. There's a physical attraction, then there's the falling in love. These are two separate things. And just because you feel attracted to someone, it doesn't mean you're gonna fall in love with them. How, maybe you're watching me now, and you're married. Maybe you're married, but you're having problems at home. And all of a sudden, you're at work, and you start feeling attracted to someone at work. You need to rein these thoughts in, because you know that if you give time to yourself to think about this attraction and you develop these ideas, you're going to make a big mistake. Maybe you say, James, but can you do that? Can you control an attraction? Maybe an attraction is something that is uncontrollable. Listen, nothing is uncontrollable. You are in control of your actions, of your thoughts, mm -hmm. and, and of what you decide to do. Mm -hmm. And between being attracted to someone and falling in love and loving someone, it takes time. For example, Elena, when we, we met, I, I liked you a lot. I was attracted to you. You were attracted to me. How could you not be? 
Did you right? hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. This, this is my fault. I praise him too much. And but then anyway, he comes up with this. <laughs> we were attracted to each other, but the love only came later. Yes. I, I usually say to people that I only told Elena that I loved her just before we got married, like, you know. In writing. In writing, like 10 months later, because I wanted to make sure that she was the right person for uh -huh. me. I still have the love letter, okay? I might decide to show our viewers one day. I don't Never, know. I don't know. ever, <laughs> too personal. <laughs> but on a, on a more serious note, um, it's not an excuse what you were talking about, about attraction and everything at work and, and you being married or, or in a commitment. Some people may, may watch this and, and think, oh, and start thinking, oh, this was all a chemical reaction, darling. <laughs> you know, I don't know what happened. Let's say that you both like to read and, and, and enjoy science and, and understanding how the body works and, you know, uh, the emotions in the brain. And then you look at this, oh, you know, a, a situation happens and then you, you turn to your partner. It was a bad chemi chemical reaction, yeah, it's darling. It's not my fault. It's not my fault, but I'm going to go to the doctors and, and check myself out, uh, in and see what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know this sounds funny, but some people, they, they like to come up with all sorts of excuses yes. for misbehaving. Absolutely, excuses. Now, we have a, a few more minutes before the break. We're going to watch another video before this break, and we're going to talk about it after the break. We'll be right back. What is love? Well, you can break it down into three components. Passion, intimacy, and commitment. Together, they make up the triangular theory of love, psychology's most robust model of love. So, what comes first? What leads to what? Well, it can really start with any, but your relationship has a better shot at surviving long-term if it possesses at least two of these components at any given time. Here's where it gets tricky, though. You can make a choice to commit to someone, but you can't decide one day to be intimate. So where does intimacy come from? How do two people grow to the point where they can just tell each other anything? Well, social scientists say the key to intimacy is expressing vulnerability and curiosity. To test this out, we did what we do best. We set up an experiment. Come on in, thank you for joining me. On nice my show. To join you on your show. Yeah. So I'm gonna be interviewing you tonight. I have a series for real? of questions. Yeah. Question number one. What strengths do I bring to our relationship? That's an easy one, actually. <laughs> you bring a lot of compassion, a lot of awareness. Describe the first moment you knew I was it for you. Uh, when you sent me a video of yourself because you didn't know how to use Skype. So you <laughs> made a video of yourself and then emailed it to me. You know, I love the things that are just you I like the fact that you sing me silly songs into my voicemail. And it was just your face and you saying hello. Um, but I was smitten from that moment. What are you most scared about our future? That you won't be able to keep up with me. Because I'm what? just always energy go and go and you're like, oh yeah, you're I'm done. No, I'm, I'm sleeping. I find that when we get into, a, into an argument, we both just repeat the same thing back at each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, that trick of like saying, I hear what you're saying. Let me make sure that I'm hearing it correctly. But that's so boring when you're in the heat of passion, so I don't know if I'll ever get there. What if you just fall out of love with me? Um, and I don't want that to happen, so I'm scared. You know, one of the things I'm realizing right now as you're talking is one of the big parts about relationships is fear management. Yeah, that's hard, but I think you're right. Like, don't let it escalate, don't let it get too hot in the negative sense. Right. Only hot in the positive sense. I just don't want to make you feel bad about yourself, I guess. I don't want to lose you either. Well, I'm lucky to have a teammate who's so capable. I don't know, I'm just learning. <laughs> I feel like you bring me out of my shell. You make take me out of my comfort zone and I like it. And then I met you and it was like I got hit by lightning. I mean, it was like not just regular love, but unconditional love. And that is something that I heard of it, I knew of it, but you brought it. I just, I see in you what you don't let anybody else see. And I love like make, building your confidence because you're so great and I love you. And Thanks babe, I love you too. I really want to kiss him now. <laughs> kiss. 
Now, one of the most important things to know about love is it never stays in the same place. Intimacy and passion rise and fall with the stresses of life. So if you feel a drop now and then, don't freak out. Doesn't mean a relationship's broken. It's just the nature of how love works. So do what you saw here. Put some energy into learning more about someone, even if you think you know it all. And have the guts to be vulnerable. You can't get anywhere if you don't take risks. I'm Julian, and this has been The Science of Love. Welcome back. So in this final video you saw before the break, uh, we were talking a lot about attachment. And, and this is something we know a little bit about because mm. we've been attached to each other for a few years, right? <laughs> more Around than, 15 now, more than isn't 10 it? Years. Yeah, 15 years. And wh what we discovered is that, you know, you, you don't get attached to something if you've had it for a week. You develop an attachment to something if you've had it for a while. And, and that becomes important to you, becomes a part of your life. It becomes something that you, you can't live without. So think when you were growing up, you had, do you remember the security blanket? When you first got it, that was new. It was like a blanket from a shop. But then your mom washed that about a hundred times, right? <laughs> and you used it. It was left around the house, not because you didn't care, but because it was part of you. It was part of your routine or every day to keep that with you. Perhaps it, it was- It has your smell. Yeah, it perhaps it was a struggle for your mom to make you let you go of your security blanket. And in a way, that person becomes like your security. For example, I, 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 when, when I'm with Elena, I feel that, you know, we belong together. We are, we, if we are not together, I feel like I'm incomplete. I shouldn't be saying this because then she, you know, she, <laughs> she gets too big headed, right? No, I don't. But this is the truth. That's what attachment is, right? Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, not only because of that, but also because you've invested so much in that relationship. Mm -hmm. You invested your time, you, in, you were forgiving, you were understanding, you, were, you built a life together. And we've, we've just built 15 years of that life together. Mm -hmm. Imagine couples who've been together for 40, 50 years or mm -hmm. even 60 years. Yeah. It, it's amazing. And, and the nice thing after you've been together for a while is that in the beginning you have a lot of these teething problems, a lot of little arguments about silly things, you fight over silly things. But then once you, you are more stable with each other, you understand each other better, then you get rid of all this little nonsense mm -hmm. from the relationship that you don't need, right? The little arguments, the little disagreements, and you can then start to enjoy the things that really matter. And, and if people say, that the, the beginning of the relationship is the best part. They don't know what they're talking about yeah. because now is the best part. I couldn't disagree anymore. No, you couldn't agree more. No, no, I don't agree with people. Let me right. rephrase. I thought you were disagreeing say, with me. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't agree and I cannot agree with people who say that the beginning mm -hmm. is the most exciting because honestly, if I, looking back, if I could jump all those what, two, three years? Mm -hmm. Pro problematic years where uh, you don't still know, you, you're not sure yet uh, where you belong in a relationship, you're learning, you're maturing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an experience, but you know, bringing this whole thing to our side, like what we've watched, the scientific thing and all the chemicals and everything. For example, in my case, I don't know about you, but I liked you first time I saw you. Mm -hmm. What about you? Did you of course, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, we, we didn't fall in love at first sight. We, we liked each other a lot when we first met. There was an attraction. But the love came later. Yes. Right? We've kind of, um, I don't know, maybe you can call it that we've put the chemicals aside for a, for a bit. I don't know. But there was attraction, mm -hmm. at least from my side. I hope from your side too. I hope. Of course. That's why we are here uh, together. <laughs> that's why we're here but, holding hands. But... It's like, you know, we've worked, we've worked our way uh, through our relationship. We, we got to know each other really well during our dating period. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't skip some very important stages. 
Uh, or even though sometimes we felt, for example, when we got married, many times your brain tells you, ah, just be angry at him or just ignore what he said. But you need to take control and, and because you, you control your mind. You can't just be led by what you hear. Oh, it's my chemicals or, you know, this is how life is and my personality doesn't really match his. Mm -hmm. And that just, just let things happen naturally. No, you need to take control of the relationship. And, and know your place and understand that, hold on, you know, he, he works so hard for, for our relationship to work. Let me do the same. Let me be more forgiving, more yeah. understanding. What do you think? Absolutely. And of course, we, we spoke about very different things today in this program that we based on the science of love. And indeed, we can say that love, in a way, it is more scientific than it is emotional. It's a good thing. If you are a person that you are very emotional and you, you fall in love every week, then unfortunately you need to look at what love really is because that's not love, that's an attraction, right? That's not very healthy, being attracted or in love with someone every week. So here's what love is. Love is when you love the person's mistakes, when you love the person's quirky little things, like when I'm driving on the motorway and Elena says, James, I have to eat now. Stop the car now. I have to eat now. And I say, look, Elena, there, there isn't a service station for another 20 miles. I need to eat now. Even that I love about you. You are not explaining <laughs> the whole story here. Do you know why he says that? There's only 20 miles. There's only a stop in 20. Because he keeps on saying to me, and this is another quirkiness of, you know, that he has that I, I, I kind of love slash you know, not, not love so much, <laughs> when he says, yes, 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 we're going to stop in, in five minutes time. <laughs> and then 15 minutes have passed. Oh, wait, wait, listen, there's another one in 10 minutes time. I promise we will stop. But there the are the times that <laughs> I, I haven't promised anything and we need to stop right now. Exactly. It was a pleasure to have you here with us and we hope you enjoyed today's program and it's been helpful for you. We'll be back again next week. But before then, Here's the Vox Pops for this week in the streets of London, what people have to say about what love really is. In English, of course, we have the word love. Um, in Greek, they have four words that cover different aspects of love. Um, philia, of course, which is brotherly affection. Uh, Storgi, which is love in the family, and um, there's eros, of course, which is erotic love. Uh, but there is also agape love, which is love uh, based on principle. And when it comes to what love is, I think that is the most important love. Yeah, what I think love is, is that um, if you care for someone more than you care for yourself, I think that's love because the most um, hated thing in the world is hate, uh, it is um, jealousy or selfishness. So once you care about someone else, that you know, you you you, you just feel that love and you want to make that person happy. I think love is uh, when you care about someone really, really much. Like he's my other person, he's my human being. <laughs> like uh, he's the second part of me. And love is wanting the best for someone else more than for yourself. I think love is something. Is once you find it, you can't let it go. It's an inexplicable feeling that you get about somebody and you just want to be with that person. I have no idea. I don't know. That's a really awkward question. I'm not sure. I don't know. We haven't a clue what it is, yes. but we just know it's about looking after each other. It's about giving, giving and making yourself vulnerable. And it's, it's about Un unconditional supportive response to any situation. You always think, what can I do to make things better? I suppose the other thing is, love is the feeling you get of being around people that only they can bring. I think love is great. Uh, love is being willing to put up with my CrossFit and yoga addiction and coming with me all the time. So I, I'd like to use this later to show my boyfriend so he knows what love is. Love is uh, a best friend that you might want to have sex with. Love is supporting your partner 
in good, bad, ugly or indifferent and trust. Would definitely be selfless giving. Uh, you can't love somebody and only focus on yourself. Um, I hear a lot of people say love is give and take. No, love is all give. Never takes, never expects anything back. I think if we're talking about romantic love, it has to be someone you can get on with even when things are really, really bad and you still want to hang out with them, whether you're in a five-star restaurant or you're not being able to pay your heating bill in Croydon. <laughs> I think love is unconditional. Um, so you, you love someone, you commit to them. Um, you, even though there's ups and downs, um, you, um, you, st you still have the love underneath that, even underneath the fights. Love is finding your best friend and just staying with them forever. And if it's your cat, then you just have to be a slave to them and then the cat will love you back. Allowing each other to be individuals and not taking things too seriously. That's a good one too. Yeah, very true, very true, very wise. Yeah, thank you. We should go out sometime. We really should. <laughs> the luck of the draw, really. <laughs> we are very course, blessed. We found we, each other, but you know. We found each other 49 years. Wow. So, yeah, it's not quite worn off yet. <laughs> well, it hasn't at all. <laughs> Will that suit you?